in in my house with my kids having access to almost anything to families where there's a household uh, where there's eight people living in a very secluded space. I mean, it's almost impossible. If someone gets it, then it's just going to run like bushfire. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so it's 7 a.m. Shall we start, Salman? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you might be. It's Saturday again, and... We are here for yet another great session of uh, pediatric neurosurgery. Today we have two great scholars in pediatric neurosurgery, not only great scholars, but great personal friends of Salman and myself. And we'll be talking about functional neurosurgery, epilepsy surgery, and it's important, it's importance. Um, and I think we all have learned through all the previous dates of, of great uh, surgical uh, techniques and nuances. And I think today it's it's going to be, again, one of those great dates. So without further delay, I'm going to introduce Professor Jeffrey Blount. Um, he is the head of the department at uh, the Birmingham Children's Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama, not the UK. Um, and Jeff has an an extended interest in epilepsy surgery for many years now, as well as in many other uh, topics. And he will talk today about hemispherectomy and hemispherotomy. So Jeff, please take it away. Thank you very much. I'm on a screen share, if I may, and see if that works. Are you seeing my slides? Yes. Perfect. All right. So let's see if we can't get this to launch. Oops, not that one. There we go. So now that you've seen the whole talk, there you go. Um, so thank you. Um, this is a great pleasure to be able to talk to you all this morning about hemispherectomy. Um, this procedure, if I had to pick one operation that I had to spend the rest of my life doing, this would probably be it. And the simple reason for that is its effectiveness and its elegant, in a sense, simplicity. It's a daunting operation in that you're disconnecting an entire half of the human brain. But at the same time, the way at least I'm going to share with you that I learned to do it and practice it in my own practice and teach our residents and fellows how to do it, centers on a series of steps that are inherently so logical that the operation just unfolds much like following a recipe. And I'm not trying to make complicated brain surgery trivialized by saying it's like baking cookies, but the beauty of the operation is that the anatomy lays out an organized series of steps that if one follows the, the inherent logic is so great that it's just a beautifully elegant operation and it's extraordinarily effective. Of all the operations we do, hemispherectomy is probably the most effective, certainly in terms of if you just look at the numbers, the, the percentages of seizure freedom. Better. Other, I really like it a lot that is an operation for some of the reasons that I just mentioned that invites itself to, to um, developing and low and middle income countries. It does not require extraordinarily expensive evaluations to identify candidates. It does not, it does not require um, extensive tests or, or expensive uh, imaging. It simply uh, is a great operation that can be simply applied and once mastered can lead to tremendous impact um, amongst patients and families uh, that otherwise would really have very, very, very little hope. So um, last point I'll make is, is that this is an operation that I very much like and my partner 
colleague and friend Brandon Rock also does, and he and I have worked together and are, and are taking every opportunity to share this operation and how to do it, uh, particularly with friends and colleagues that are building and growing epilepsy programs. Once this operation is, is, is mastered and learned, it can be done and, um, and, and, and expanded to, to the benefit of literally thousands and thousands of children and families around the world. So, so with that, this is, the, this is the outline of how this operation is done. This operation is done, or whether you divide it into seven, eight, nine, ten 10 steps, the key concept here is, is that the anatomy defines the operation and the, uh, the operation is perfectly, um, it, it is perfectly organized around the anatomy. We'll come back to that because we're going to go through each step. Let's just talk for a couple of minutes just to kind of lay this out in terms of the way that it unfolded. How did hemispherectomy unfold? I think everybody has a historical sense of the, the, the short term, the thumbnail view of hemispherectomy. But when you actually go back and look at the history, there's something telling here that I think is valuable and sometimes gets lost in the, in the storytelling. So originally, Hemispheric removal, back in the days when neurosurgery was kind of in its infancy or certainly in its childhood, hemispheric removal had two simple indications. One was for a hemispheric glioma. Recall, there was no imaging. There was no subtleties of picking up small changes on an imaging study. Everything was about really big, massive problems. So these poor souls that would come in with these hemispheric tumors that could be localized through physical examination, very early rudimentary imaging had hemispheric gliomas. And so surgeons trying to make the best of a terrible situation would literally remove a whole hemisphere, right? And then the other indication was simply those children who had infantile hemiplegia. And we even to this day recognize those patients still as the probably the best single candidates for this operation. Certainly the easiest ones in which to do the operation. We can do it in children with hemimegencephaly, holohemispheric cortical dysplasias, other reasons. But the children with infantile hemiplegia, which is to say perinatal strokes, are the group that probably to this day remain the absolute most attractive patients. Most laypersons don't realize that children can have strokes. Many non-epilepsy surgeons and pediatricians don't realize how epileptogenic um, infarcted tissue and the borders of infarcted tissue are. But this is where this operation began, is in holohemispheric, glio or holohemispheric gliomas and in the syndrome of the children with infantile hemiplegia, which of course now we recognize as perinatal strokes. Well, early on, they recognized very quickly that the patients that they operated on with glioma did terribly, right? These patients, unfortunately, all they did was protract a very bad outcome survival for the patients with holohemispheric gliomas. So that fell away quite quickly. If the patients survived the surgery, they were left with terrible deficits, often severe complications. And so that operation fell out of favor really quite quickly. By contrast, the children who had anatomic hemispherectomy for infantile hemiplegia really did very, very well, but they did well for a limited period of time. And then this curious phenomenon came on whereby a certain percentage of them, but a significant percentage of them, a quarter or a third, would develop this decline. And the decline came late and the decline came insidiously, but progressively. And it was relentless and it ultimately ended up in mortality in about 50% of the people that showed those signs. Well, this got a variety of different labels that we now have all boxed under this superficial cerebrohemosiderosis label. Because when they looked at these specimen cavities post-mortem, post there was blood, there was hemosiderin, there was breakdown product, and they were large. Now, exactly what the bleeding surface was, was never really determined. Nobody could identify what the surface of the bleeding came from. Where was it? There's a very high likelihood that a significant component of this was just simply hydrocephalus that occurred in a pre-CT, pre-MR era, and wasn't sufficiently recognized, picked up, treated, they didn't have the options that we do to treat it. So a big component of it was, was hydrocephalus, but it, clearly there was this 
component of bloody fluid with membranes that exerted mass effect, that exerted some toxicity and killed half the patients that came back in with this. So anatomic hemispherectomy came to be recognized as, 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 as a very mixed procedure. Uh, it would work very effectively for children with infantile hemiplegia, but a very significant percentage would get this terrible complication. They'd be well for a while and then their families, providers and the patients themselves would see themselves decline relentlessly and nothing could be done. So anatomic hemispherectomy developed this tremendous weight associated with this, this tremendously unacceptable morbidity. So the, 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 the challenge was on, if you will, the challenge was on to decrease the amount of tissue that was removed because they couldn't identify a single bleeding source. It was thought that the less tissue you leave, the, pardon me, the less tissue you remove, the less bleeding source you provide, then probably the less the likelihood of this problem occurring. So at that point, a variety of different surgeons embraced and took on a number of different techniques for trying to do a more functional hemispherectomy, okay? And so a variety of techniques came on, probably led by the group in Montreal. Rasmussen and others in Montreal probably were the most creative, innovative thinkers on this. And there, from that point forward, the learning surgeon today can just sort of say, there was a block of different efforts to try and reduce the amount of tissue that was removed, okay? And Rasmussen and the functional hemispherectomy of Rasmussen was sort of the first step. And then that was refined by Villemur, uh, who was one of Rasmussen's students in that elegant paper, that one of the first papers that just talked about peri-insular hemispherotomy, where they used the anatomy, they studied the anatomy to to enable this operation to occur. Now, it's had a variety of different modifications over the years. And I think in my own learning, and I think in the learning of many others, Professor Schramm in Germany gets a tremendous amount of effort. My own residents and fellows of all the people on the planet who I've learned the most from it, maybe Professor Schramm of anybody that I did not train with. He's a remarkable man. He shares his thoughts. He shares his experience very liberally and uh, has, has, has taught us all a great deal. He refined the techniques. And in a series of papers, I, I wrote 2012 there, but he's got a 2012 and a 2015 manuscript. The serious student of peri hemispherotomy will have in his or her library the Rasmussen papers, the Villemur papers, and certainly a familiarity with Professor Schramm's work. Well, these aren't the only techniques that are used for, uh, for hemispherectomy. And there's been some recent work that's taken a completely different look at this, many from, or the, the most robust of which uh, has come from India and from uh, uh, Professor Sood uh, in Detroit who have talked about doing this uh, endoscopically. So the recent favorites, as is nicely diagrammed here, we, there was a lovely meeting a few years ago uh, in, in Sweden where a number of people got together who were interested in just sitting down at a meeting and talking about techniques. Uh, and this paper that Jim, ba Jim uh, Baumgartner and I uh, wrote kind of came out of it. Th this outlines the, the conceptually the, um, the different techniques that are, that are kind of common now. This is the anatomic scheme of the periinsular hemispherotomy that we're gonna spend some more time talking about. You can just sort of characterize these as either a horizontal approach, a vertical approach, or an endoscopic approach. And I think that's a very nice organizational strategy for the um, student scholar surgeon of hemispherotomy in 2020, 2021. Uh, in my mind, the periinsular hemispherotomy is the preferred horizontal technique in which the, the surgeon's approach is fundamentally horizontally through the sylvian fissure, identifying the insula and the circular sulcus that defines the margins of the insula, using that as a gateway into the ventricle, which trans, transects the descending white matter from the frontal neocortex and the temporal neocortex, i.e. the frontal stem and the temporal stem respectively. Uh, also nicely diagrammed here. And again, we'll go through this some more. Contrasting with this very popular and increasingly popular vertical parasagittal hemispherotomy popularized by Delant. Okay, now I don't know too much about this. Um, 
I, I first kind of heard about it, learned about it, and, and discussed it with my late good friend Sanjeev Badia from Miami and have read about it and attended lectures, but I'll leave you to greater experts than I to discuss the vertical, whoops, pardon me, to discuss the vertical uh, means of doing a hemispherotomy. That is worth hearing about, worth learning, but I have no expertise to bring. Similarly, I think in an era where minimally invasive techniques continue to grow, uh, the, this is very provocative work that's been put forward by uh, Professor Chandra uh, in India and then uh, Dr. Sood in Detroit. They both are using basically the vertical approach only they're using the endoscope and starting with an endoscopic callosotomy to gain access to the ventricle and then doing the work from within the ventricle. So these techniques are mentioned for completeness and to be uh, appropriate to, 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 to share with you the most active work in hemispherotomy right now. But the rest of my comments will center on periinsular hemispherotomy. We I had a great resident named Christoph Griesenauer, who, uh, along with Peter Winkler uh, and, and, and our group, did a, a systematic review just a few years ago and published it in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. This is kind of the state of the art, kind of regardless of the pathway that one takes, about three quarters to 80% of patients that undergo a properly performed hemispherotomy can and should be seizure-free postoperatively, right? So maybe a quarter fail to attain seizure freedom. Most of the time that's from multifocal disease from a kindled alt, uh, opposite hemisphere, but sometimes it's from incomplete disconnection. And that's a really important thing for us to detect as surgeons. Hydrocephalus is probably the complication that most of us get the most concerned about because we don't want to leave a shunt behind if we don't have to, but a shunted life is still better than a life with medically resistant uh, epilepsy. Uh, these are still very serious operations. The mortality still exists. It's a very small percent, uh, but, it is, but, it, but it is real, including in our series. We have a patient who did not uh, survive. All right, so let's talk about this now. And I'm going to show you a video at the end that kind of goes through these steps one at a time. But in terms of just thinking about the exposure, the, everything about a periinsular hemispherotomy centers on the sylvian fissure and the insula, right? And the insula is that part of cortex that's covered by the frontal and temporal operculum. So the first thing that we do is, is that we do a craniotomy that exposes the sylvian fissure. We need good exposure of the operculae, uh, which is the next step of the process, okay? So you've got to expose the operculae um, and you've got to expose the entirety of the sylvian fissure. The reason that the kids with stroke are the best is best initial candidates is simply because um, uh, volume loss makes the dissection of the operculae much easier. And we'll go through that when we look, when we look at the video here. All right, let me just do something here. Cancel that. So this diagram here, again, emphasizes why it is so essential to get that opercular dissection done first. By removing the operculate, can you all see my arrow? Okay, so by removing the operculae, one gains a view of the insula. The insula is down here. This is where the middle cerebral artery branches are draping over. The operculae are removed so that we can see the insula. And in seeing the insula, that gives us the circular sulcus. And when we can see the circular sulcus, we come directly in orthogonally and we fall into the ventricle. So that's very nicely outlined in this series of diagrams uh, that Benny Iskandar had uh, done at Wisconsin, where everything revolves right around this, this insula here, hence peri-insula. We come in from the outside, removing the frontal and temporal opercula, gaining a view of the insula so that we work our way around the insula. That's the key strategic understanding. That, that's the key step as far as, um, as far as gaining access into 
the, the ventricle. And therein, you've set the stage for the opening. So once you remove the insula, then you either you, you can either remove the insula by on block reflecting it up, which works beautifully in kids that have had stroke and have a lot of gliosis within that insular region, well, pardon me, within that opercular region, or for kids with holohemispheric dysplasias where the tissue is more robust, more vascular, you can just do simple subpeel aspiration. And if you're doing that, the key there is staying within your peel boundaries and recognizing the peel boundaries. I can't emphasize the importance of the PIA enough. I beat my fellows and my residents with that, that if you're gonna be an epilepsy surgeon, the key is to recognize whether you're operating in the opercula and the insula or whether you're operating in the medial temporal lobe, you have to gain a sensitivity for the PIA because the PIA is the natural border that keeps the, uh, that keeps the, um, the epilepsy surgeon safe. So we dissect down the PIA of the opercula until the PIA ends. And where the PIA ends, that's the anatomic feedback that one has reached the circular sulcus. It's the, when the ending of the PIA, and it's as distinct as can be, you, the, once the PIA ends, then you are looking at the circular sulcus. Once you're there, you've got the circular sulcus completely exposed all the way around. You've got the vessels of the uh, MCA draped over the insula and you can begin working your way through the circular sulcus, okay? Once that's identified, the circular sulcus can just be very gently aspirated and one literally comes right down into the ependema. Identification of the circular sulcus is the key to unlocking the periinsular hemispherotomy. That's what gives you the whole term periinsular. Peri meaning around, insula obviously meaning the insula itself. So once you get that periinsular component of it identified by the uh, circular sulcus, which again is anatomically the feedback there is the loss of pia as one comes down the um, operculae, whether frontal or temporal, the pia just runs right out. It stops. And when it stops, you're right over the circular sulcus. You don't need navigation. You don't need anything. Once you transfer the circular sulcus, you enter the ventricle. We like to do it in the front, right over the frontal pole and we like to do it in the temporal region, okay? And if one thinks about the ventricle as a C-shaped shaped structure, now it becomes a matter of just, in a sense, connecting the uh, Frontally, you've got it temporally, and it becomes an issue of aspirating and unroofing the entire lateral surface of the ventricle by working through the circular sulcus around the insula to trace that C-shape of the ventricle. We like to proceed from caudally from the frontal horn and rostrally from the temporal horn. You kind of meet at the back portion of the insula. And that's a caution zone because sometimes there's some large distal MCA branches that are running off the back edge of the, um, of the, the back edge of the insula. And you have to be careful because you don't want to, um, you don't want to uh, tear one of those back there because it'd be a good sized vessel in a, in a deep hole. So that's probably my caution for the, for the greatest safety uh, region is at the back of the insula as you do your exposure there. Okay, once you're in the ventricle, you've got the whole lateral edge of the ventricle exposed. Then the next step is to do the temporal disconnection. The temporal disconnection is done just like a temporal lobectomy. You're looking through the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle and on its medial edge, you can see the bulge of the hippocampus, the bulge of the amygdala way up front at the, at the tip of the, of, the, of the temporal horn. Dr. Professor Schramm is very confident and simply does a dissection of the fornix, but most surgeons that I've talked to do a conventional hippocampectomy. And again, your PIA keeps you safe, just like it does in doing an anterior temporal lobectomy. You get the PIA over the medial surface of the hippocampus, keep that PIA intact. That keeps you out of the cistern that protects the third nerve and the posterior communicator just behind it. Next step is to do the interventricular corpus callosotomy, which this is a lovely picture that came from John Gervin's book uh, that came out about a year ago. This is a lovely picture that shows the angle at which the sucker needs to be angled up. When you're looking lateral to medial, and again, we're gonna look at this in a minute in the video. When you're looking lateral to medial, again, you're looking across that lateral ventricle, 
what you have to do is go up about two thirds of the way and angle up two thirds of the way. So in other words, if you go up two thirds of the way and angle up about 60 degrees, that will take you in just like on the upper part of this diagram here, it will take you across the corpus callosum and take you right to the inner hemispheric fissure. And your visual target is to see the vessels. The vessels are the two pericolosal arteries, okay? And this is caution point number two. The, you don't wanna injure particularly the contralateral pericolosal artery, because that's the way that you can induce an unexpected neurological deficit in this operation. You've got to unroof the pericolosals, and the pericolosals tend to run together. If you're unlucky, unfortunate, uh, clumsy, burn those two pericolosals, you can get a downstream infarct on the contralateral side. So you you have to be a little careful. You unroof the tissue. Uh, sometimes another thing one has to be careful of. Sometimes there's some significant veins come. Sometimes there's some significant veins coming up to a um, uh, inferior sagittal sinus uh, underneath the, um, the, the the through the corpus callosum. But that's usually a fairly straightforward dissection. The venous presence increases as the dissection uh, proceeds posteriorly. And the probably the most difficult part of the operation is to get back to the arachnoid overlying the great vein of Galen. And that's the essential thing that you have to see posteriorly. The most common area of incomplete disconnection is at the splenium of the corpus callosum back over the arachnoid of the great vein of Galen. And that's the key area that one has to pay attention to because you don't have a complete disconnection until you're looking at that arachnoid over that critical structure. Um, navigation can help if you have it. If you don't have it, you always have that anatomic feedback that you wanna dissect back. Use the Falx as your guide once it's uncovered to make sure you're staying on the midline, but keep taking that white matter until you are looking at the arachnoid over the great vein of Galen. Once you find those pericolosals, I always say to the residents and the fellows, don't let those pericolosals out of your sight because you're gonna follow those pericolosals. We've already, already talked about following them caudally to go around and get the splenium, but you're gonna follow them rostrally. Rostrally, you're gonna follow them as the plexus wraps around. The, the, the pericolosals are gonna take you back to the anterior cerebral. The anterior cerebral is gonna take you to the MCA. You can define the border of the um, anterior basal disconnection by exactly that maneuver. I learned this from Professor Schramm. Most, the, the, the other common area where people leave tissue is in the frontobasal disconnection. They're worried about leaving tissue. Uh, they're worried about, pardon me, falling too posterior into the hypothalamus. So they tend to die forward onto the planum sphenoidale and they leave tissue in that frontal basal region that's still connected. So the microscope has to follow in a very characteristic sort of pronounced rotation as one follows the post, the, the, the anterior cerebrals to the bifurcation. And then once, once you get there, then you just draw a line to the greater wing of the sphenoid. And at that point, the only thing left is the insula at which it's just gently dis dissected and disconnected. Some people will define a plane above the insula, come in behind it and lift the whole thing. I always leave an EVD behind and leave it in place for about four or five days for just the problem that we talked about before with regard to hydrocephalus. So it's a highly effective, it's complex operation, but it can be steps. Steps are, are if, if one completes these steps in a stepwise manner, it's a safe, effective procedure that's highly likely to exert a very profound effect I shared this picture here because these are your ideal candidates. One can see the thickened arachnoid here of a child that's had a perinatal stroke. You've got volume loss. You've got smaller opercula than usual. These are very, very um, inviting candidates for surgery. Good neurosurgeons around the globe can do this operation, learn this operation safely, and cure children that otherwise would have no chance of, of gaining medical control. Uh, there are other candidates, hemimegencephaly cases and holohemispheric cortical dysplasias can be done, but they are an order of magnitude more, dif more difficult. And I, I would simply suggest that 
one gain uh, significant experience and confidence doing the operation in some children with um, with uh, perinatal strokes and uh, infantile hemiplegia before taking on these, these more difficult cases. If you get in a situation where you've got to do a hemimegencephaly case, the, the one pearl that I would share that I've done with every one that, I, every one that I've done uh, a hemimeg on is to put an EVD in frontally and then track the EVD to the ventricle. Just subpeely dissect down the EVD to the ventricle because that gets you there and gets you that gets you into the ventricle, get you that ependymal surface where you can get your cotenoid in and then start working your way around in the, in the C-shaped structure and get a bunch of tissue out. Okay, so similar series of successful cases from the literature, 80%, 100% seizure free rates if the underlying etiology is stroke or uh, infantile hemiplegia. So let me um, escape from PowerPoint here because what I want to share with you here is um, this is can you can you all hear me okay can can you see the um, let's see bring your yes, share yes you can okay yes, can you can. can you see the video uh, Adrian no nope you can you might want to collapse that and see if your video pulls up okay let's see because I really want you to see this video let's see hold on. <clears throat> There, can you see it now? No, we're, we're still looking at your screen. Maybe- uh... Sir, you have to reshare your screen. I have to reshare? Yes, sir. Okay, let's see what I can redo. Let's see what I can do now. Screen sharing, new share. Try that. Did that work? Yep. Okay, good. Now let's see if it still works if I make it full size. Rock, uh, that's can you hear Brandon when he uh, when he speaks? Adrian, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can, but not the audio from the video. But not the audio from the video. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Here, I, I'll. So what we've done here is is that we've done a left sided ter terrional craniotomy. This is the Sylvian Fisher. Can you see my arrow, Adrian? Yes, we can. Okay, so here's the Sylvian fissure, okay? This is the left side, so we've got frontal and temporal exposure. This is the superior temporal gyrus here. The Sylvian fissure defined here, and the inferior frontal gyrus here. So we're looking at the left side. We're co coagulating, cauterizing, and cutting the pia of the superior temporal gyrus here. Standard subpeal dissection techniques are, are being used here. Right, this is not an infantile hemiplegia case. As you can see, the tissue is pretty vascular. We're doing standard subpeel aspiration here. We're just trying to expose the contents of the sylvian fissure, the, the um, insula, and the circular sulcus. We're working our way down through the operculae, and this is standard subpeel dissection techniques, identifying wow. just these operculae trying to keep our, uh, the peel planes clear here. If one looks carefully, the pia of the insula is down in that region right there. It's a clear peel margin, and that needs to be respected and protected because as one develops the opercular dissection across the surface of the insula, it be, the insula delivers itself more and more clearly. You can see the sucker is on a peel plane. If you look critically, there's that glisten of a peel plane. Now the inferior frontal gyrus is the same thing's happening. Peel coagulation that's open sharply followed by subpeel aspiration to remove the opercula. There I'm removing or brand one of us is removing the opercula. Again, trying to define that insula that's deep to us that we're gonna get that nice circular exposure around the insula. Here we're just, <clears throat> pardon me, we're just removing this frontal opercula using standard techniques of subpeel dissection. Now we're in the superior circular sulcus right here. And this again is defined 
by the end of the pia, the, the, there's pia on the insula and there's pia on the frontal operculum. As one works your way down, you'll notice that that pia just stops. It just plain old stops. And when it stops, you are in the circular sulcus and you work your way around the insula to define that circular sulcus. And oftentimes, particularly in the hemiplegic kids, you've got that insula just beautifully exposed hanging out there and all around it, you can identify that circular sulcus. And once you start crossing it, you come into pure white matter. And there we pop through that frontal stem into the lateral ventricle. You can see the CSF come up. We take a cotenoid, we enter into the body of the lateral ventricle, right? In this particular case, we, uh, we had left, typically remove the entirety of the frontal operculum for gaining access to the ventricle. But in this particular video, this is a little bit of the frontal operculum that's left. You see us holding the pia there with the, with the, bio, with the uh, bipolar and just removing the tissue, um, removing the tissue uh, within it. So now we come through the rest of the circular sulcus. We are unroofing the lateral ventricle. I like to put cotton. I like to kind of fill the ventricle with cotton. We're working through the circular sulcus around the insula, right? All this is insula. This is circular sulcus. We're working through the circular sulcus around the insula, hence periinsular, periinsular hemispherotomy, working around the insula this way. We're coming farther into the ventricle, retracting it. Now we're coming into the atrium, and this is where one has to be careful of large um, MCA distal branches. They're not common, but occasionally they occur coming off of that insula running posteriorly. You just have to watch for them and just not injure them or avulse them or anything like that. Usually not a problem with experienced surgeons, but sometimes learners, you gotta be a little careful here. That's a cortical branch of the MCA coming off the back of that insula, just like I was talking about. That one was coagulated and taken. It's perfectly safe to coagulate and take them, but you have to exercise judgment because some of them are large, large enough that they don't really lend themselves to simple bipolar. Most of the time they can be taken. You, you can take them with impunity. The single issue is just whether or not they're, they're, they're small enough to be taken. Again, we continue working around the insula, peri-insular. Around we go. Now, so now we're coming into the in, now we're coming into the temporal horn and connecting the two um, openings. We opened the uh, temporal tip earlier. We opened the frontal horn. You can see uh, from the retracted tissue. You can see those nice ependymal surfaces down there. This is the medial temporal resection being done just like an anterior temporal lobectomy protecting deep pia to keep you out of the cistern with the third nerve and most importantly, the descending um, uh, peduncle, which of course do doesn't matter because you've already taken that hemisphere above, but just that's what, that, that's, the, that's the anatomic plane. So we subpele dissect the amygdala and the hippocampus so as to disconnect the limbic structures uh, and, and the limbic outflow pathway, the temporal horn. Remember the temporal tissue, temporal neocortex has two outflow pathways. One is neocortical through the temporal stem, conventional white matter, and the other of course is limbic. So the connections to the um, amygdala, hippocampus, and then out through the fornix and the so-called papaz circuit. So here again, we're doing a standard sort of subpeel dissection in the temporal region, removing the temporal, removing the medial temporal structures, preserving the pia, which is notable for its glistening surface there deep, right? Preserve that pia. If you're going to be an epilepsy surgeon, you've got to learn to pia. Is the surgeon's friend? 
So you've completed your hippocampal resection when the fimbria, the, the fimbria, the fornix is, is resected, but we usually remove the whole thing. Now we come back to the frontal horn and we're going to do that transventricular corpus callosotomy that I alluded to earlier. Note that we're up the wall of the ventricle, opening the roof of the lateral ventricle about two thirds of the way up. And our end point here is the, is the pericolosal arteries. And again, you can see that cisternal space just above the bipolar and it's in that space, just above the bipolar right now are those pink pericolosal arteries, right in here, right there. And you watch closely for those pericolosal arteries. And, and you, once, you once you see them, don't let go of them, follow them. You unfold that along the A2s all the way back to the A1s. Follow the A2s to the A1s, and that will take you around the frontal tip down to the bifurcation. That takes you through the anterior corpus callosum. Again, the pericolosals being your endpoint. Now we've come down frontally, and that at the tip of the resection of the catheter, of the uh, suction catheter just a moment ago, was the olfactory uh, tract. So you've completed the vertical part of your anterior basal disconnection. And then I always look laterally at this point to make sure that we're resected all the way out to the sphenoid wing, because that, that point right there is what uh, defines your anterior, your frontobasal disconnection. And that's an important area where you can miss. In this case, we do the posterior component after the anterior. I usually finish with the anterior. This is the posterior corpus callosotomy following the pericolosals back. And sometimes they winnow out to very thin, wispy little tentacles. So if that's the case, I'll use the free edge of the falx to follow it around and down through the corpus callosum, and you don't stop until you see the arachnoid over the great veins. The venous content will increase a bit as you work your way posteriorly, and this can be a difficult area um, to, uh, to see the base of. This area is probably the, 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 most, the easiest area to still leave tissue disconnected, but this kind of just steady uh, use of the bipolar and the suction together, the bipolar to show the tissue for the suction. This is pretty avascular because it's all white matter. There can be some veins that are on their way to, a, to an inferior sagittal sinus um, in this area. You get a little venous bleeding. You see that venous plexus he's picked up with the sucker right there. But you basically follow that arachnoidal plane. You can see the, the turn there. As we turn now, we're making our way down. The splenium is now being aspirated, and we're, we're looking for that arachnoid over the great vein that defines the completion of the posterior part of the uh, callosotomy that's done across and within the ventricle. So again, at this point, once you get to this point where the corpus callosotomy is complete and you've done your anterobasal disconnection, once you see that, all that's left now is the insula. See, now that view right there is exactly what I was talking about earlier, how you're looking right at and around the insula. You've worked around that circular sulcus across the frontal and temporal stem. Now all we're doing here is, is we're just working between the vessels of the candelabra, taking what we need to, to decorticate uh, the insula. And this can be done in a variety of different ways. All that gray matter needs to be uh, suction aspirated. It can largely be done between the vessels. One can reach up to the top and mobilize the insula folded toward you and the vessels tend to stay laterally and you can come in behind them. I've done that before as well. This just needs to be done to the extent where the gray matter is decorticated. In this particular case, we've basically rolled the whole thing up. One can see the gray matter being elevated and differentiating it from the white matter below. So this is, this is the insular um, decortication that's necessary to prevent failure of disconnection from actually insular cortex, particularly important in holohemispheric uh, cortical dysplasias. But of course, it's an important step in all of our, um, all of our hemispherotomy. So those are, you know, those are the essential steps uh, involved. The, the, the section is just about complete here with these last stages of uh, resection there. So that concludes a periinsular hemispherotomy with the exception of one thing. I always 
always, always leave an external ventricular drain. At the end, you see on a post-op CT scan, you see this characteristic C-shaped appearance of you've worked around peri, the insula, insular hemispherotomy, and you've very nicely attained, um, you very nicely, um, you very nice attained uh, disconnection of the entire of the entire hemisphere. So with that, I will close, uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions or comments. Uh, if anything's not clear, um, please ask. Um, there, I, the last point that I want to make is that um, the Evan Cohn, uh, Cohn, Aaron Cohn Goodall on the Neurosurgical Atlas has a wonderful. Uh, operative video of periinsular hemispherotomy that's done by Jim Rutka that is out there for everybody to see, know, have, and use. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's widely available on the internet. There's no cost to it. Um, I learned the technique from Jim Rutka, um, and uh, I highly, I think it's a wonderful operation and I hope that we can continue growing our network of friends and colleagues uh, around the globe who are using this to help children with these terrible epilepsies. So with that, uh, Adrian, I will pause and be happy to take any questions that might, might, might be there. So Jeff, I would really like to thank you. I think you're a master of this technique and you know, I, I don't see any way how we could explain it any better in, in, in a simpler stepwise fashion. Uh, one of the things is that, uh, as you mentioned, some of these procedures uh, can radically change the outcome and, and the life of a child uh, done early enough. And it does not require high tech. It's, it's just mastering, you know, simple neurosurgical technique. Um, in the past, I used to use the uh, ultrasonic aspirator, but soon enough, I realized that my best buddy is that sucker and my fingertip just for regulating the aspiration, uh, you know, behind the, um, the arachnoid plane as you work around the ventricle. I, I, I think you emphasize, emphasize it, and I can't emphasize it en en enough that you should be very careful as you're coming through in every single plane. Um, so it, it's a great lesson that you have taught us today. We have the advantage and, and I just remember that Sandy has an additional way of doing it endoscopically assisted. So I requested Sandy to, in, in the very last minute, to pull up some of his slides from previous IFNE courses. So I think today it's going to be a feast of functional neurosurgical approaches around the uh, hemispherectomy. Sandy, can, can you please show us some of yours before we proceed to your talk, just to enrich the, the theme? Thank Someone, you do you want much. to say something in the meantime? There was one hand good. up. Yeah. It's a br brilliant talk. I think um, the, you just made the concept so easy and uh, made it so clear for everybody to um, see. And you're very right. Until you see this yourself, you've seen the video, you've seen somebody operate. Uh, the, the concept really doesn't sink in properly. But here you made it really, really uh, easy for us. So I'm grateful for that. A brilliant talk. Sandy, mm -hmm. you, you want to carry on? Sorry. Thank you. That, that Thank was you very kind. Much. Thank you, Jeff. That was that was an awesome talk. Um, it makes it very easy for me to follow because you have laid out all the concepts already. So this is wonderful. Um, so um, uh, Adrian asked for uh, to show kind of a contrast. Um, I learned it exactly the same way that you explained it, Jeff. Um, a periinsular hemispherotomy, uh, and over time, actually evolved and. Um, to learning the, the vertical approach. And this is what the, um, the, the approach looks like now. Um, the, the anatomy is actually exactly as you laid it out. Um, and the cuts and the steps are the same, but it's actually, a, a, we flip the approach. So it's a, an interhemispheric approach to be able to uh, cut the corpus callosum um, uh, and then the insula, and then actually do the frontal basal disconnection. Um, I use neuro navigation from up front um, when um, that, but you can actually see the anatomy very well. Uh, I'll show the video. Um, 
So you'll see, even if your navigation is, is not working, you can actually see the anatomy very, very well. Uh, but it, it does help to, to start off. Uh, the position is, is this way so that you do an interhemispheric approach. The ergonomics uh, in the operating room is that there's an assistant who's holding the scope and the um, uh, surgeon actually has two hands uh, with a controllable suction and a bipolar um, first cases for implementation, exactly as you said, a uh, perinatal stroke um, is, is really kind of the, the safest to, to, uh, to, to start. Um, so um, I'll narrate this. It's an interhemispheric exposure. You'll see the falcs on the right bottom side um, uh, here. So that's the falcs. This is the corpus callosum that we're working on. Um, and we got to that from the paired pericolosal. It's the white matter of the corpus callosum still looking a little bit anteriorly. And really the view with the endoscope is really very similar to what you would see with a microscope, but, but you can really kind of zoom in and out in a dynamic way. Um, the subpeal dissection, uh, exactly as you said, looking for um, the ACA. And then in a perinatal stroke, you're gonna see that kind of cyst, right? So, um, so you know, definitely um, important to recognize when there's going to be abnormal anatomy. So you really make sense of what you're looking at. So that's looking into the cyst. So the insular cut, actually, um, there's going to be those um, the, those uh, short vessels that can really bleed. So it's really important to um, to use the bipolar uh, to make sure that everything is um, well coagulated. And then since we're working from within the ventricle, everything is based on the ventricular anatomy. So now we're actually looking into the temporal horn. Um, and then uh, here, the, the frontal basal disconnection, um, also um, doing a subpeal resection, uh, looking from the ACA over to the MCA. And you'll see that you actually have a, a really nice um, subpeal resection from your frontal basal disconnection. Um, and, then, uh, and then we're also able to do a, a hippocampal disconnection as well uh, from within the ventricle and from within the, um, uh, uh, within the temporal horn. Here's actually looking at that. You'll see the familiar hippocampus um, over here on the left side. And here, as, as we're doing this appeal resection, you'll, you'll actually be able to see the tentorial edge, uh, the third nerve and the PCA on the other side. So the orientation here is you're looking from within the ventricle, but um, you've actually cut through your insula uh, being lateral to your caudate um, and being able to inspect all of your disconnections. So having um, uh, that vertical um, uh, approach um, makes the, the bony opening uh, smaller um, and the, uh, Hold on, let me advance the slide somehow. Um, yeah, uh, and makes the, the access um, and the opening and closing uh, um, smaller and faster uh, with much less soft tissue edema um, at the uh, uh, perioperative and postoperative uh, timing. I, I also always leave an ABD. So a postoperative DTI. Always have backup plans if you're going to uh, go endoscopic. Um, make sure that you understand when uh, it, it uh, would be appropriate to convert to open craniotomy if needed. Uh, I've done 25 now, if not needed to convert, um, but always have backup plans uh, and really um, looking at that learning curve and, and selecting cases for implementation um, so that uh, there is increasing complexity over time. So that's kind of a summary of, of um, a different approach, but exactly the same um, anatomic uh, principles. Sandy, I think that's great. I think that's a fantastic uh, counterpart. And for the observers, um, again, I think you're hearing a, a basic idea here that number one, this is an operation that can be done very effectively without necessarily super high tech or super um, expensive workup. It's a clinical recognition of the problem. Start simply, start with case selection. Don't start with a hemimegencephaly. Don't start with a holohemispheric dysplasia that looks MR normal, right? The cases to start with are the cases where some of the pathology has done a little bit of the work for you, which is to say there's some volume loss. There's some room in which to work. 
Sandy's beautifully shown the vertical approach. Um, she emphasized start with somebody that's done it a few times, start with, uh, observe some, get, work from a very logical order. You saw her uh, case uh, presentation had four or five specific steps. I presented eight, but the number doesn't matter. The concept is, is that you're using this anatomy to unfold and unlock each of those important connection pathways. And with that type of approach, you don't have to memorize anything. It's all inherently logical and it unfolds. And then you gradually work your way up in terms of complexity and you can do a tremendous service. This operation and callosotomy can be done by many good neurosurgeons all around the world without millions of dollars <clears throat> in fancy imaging, um, fancy, uh, you know, uh, functional imaging. Uh, you, you need to recognize a, a patient pattern, hemiplegic, medically resistant epilepsy, and these kids do great. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of them out there, and they are a wonderful start for a pediatric epilepsy program from which you gain confidence, you gain experience, you gain uh, all the things that are necessary to get traction in this world. And once you've done a bit of this, now you're off. You're off to the races and you can help a world of kids. And um, so, uh, Sandy, I think that was just great. Uh, I, I really uh, applaud your learning it through the minimally invasive technique. I suspect as the wheel of time turns, that technique will become increasingly uh, popular. And uh, I think that's the direction. Thank you so much. Um, okay. okay, so um, although Sandy has started, I, I didn't have it, the chance to properly introduce. Sandy is a great friend, and as many of you probably know, uh, we all run back to the same institution, which is the Children's Hospital of Chicago, uh, through that lineage. I, I was deeply, deeply happy that she went on to become the chair of, of the department, and I think she has contributed significantly to the advancement of many of the things that are being done nowadays in Chicago. Um, so without further delay, Sandy, please go on to talk us about corpus callosotomy. Thank you so much. Um, so I think Dr. Blount has set a, a really um, great tone uh, for this morning. I'm gonna talk about corpus callosotomy um, and, and um, really talk about the role um, and then um, the, the discussion about the extent of the corpus callosotomy and then really the surgical evolution and techniques that you'll see in the literature. So the, we know the rationale for epilepsy surgery really to, to um, halt the detrimental effects of, of seizures on the developing brain. So then those detrimental effects are from the recurrent seizures and also from the anti-epileptic drugs themselves and the side effects and with the epileptic encephalopathy uh, that, that is set up by the recurrent seizures, there's developmental stagnation and regression. So especially in children, um, there's, there's the plasticity of the developing nervous system that it's really important to um, uh, capitalize on. And there's really a role for surgery when it can be performed safely and effectively. And that's really for any epilepsy surgery. So kind of within the whole spectrum uh, of epilepsy surgery, there are some that are considered more palliative and some that are considered more curative. Um, Dr. Blount talked about hemispherectomy, um, which really uh, enjoys a, a, a much higher um, seizure freedom rate in, in well-selected patients. Uh, that's uh, um, at over 60%. When we talk about corpus callosotomy, it, it usually is discussed in the palliative realm um, where we don't um, expect seizure freedom per se, but really um, looking at drop attacks and, and looking at improving the quality of life and, in, uh, and decreasing the number of, um, uh, of injuries uh, that happen uh, from, from these uh, drop attacks. Um, and also really having a, a much um, greater uh, seizure control rate as well. So, you know, I think of this as more a, a disconnective type of surgery rather than a resective surgery. So we're, we're kind of heading in this um, disconnective realm. So when we think about the, the history 
This was first introduced by Dr. Van Wagenen and Heron in um, 1940. So when you, when you think about the corpus callosum in the brain, it's really in the, the middle of the brain. Um, it, it's a, a midline structure. Um, so the interhemispheric type of approach um, from any angle really um, is what the structure lends itself to. Uh, and when, when we look at it, all these different um, techniques and approaches, uh, there's different re refinements over time, but that, that's really the structure that we're trying to get at. And, and, and it can come in all sorts of shapes, right? Some are flatter, some are curvier. Um, so the rationale is, is really to disconnect um, the, um, the corpus callosum so that there's no synchronization of epileptiform discharges um, between the, the both hemispheres, right? So the, the, the goal is to reduce the severity or, or the frequency of these, of these generalizations, um, and especially in, in the types of seizure patterns with falls. So, you know, classically we hear about the atonic seizures, but tonic and myoclonic seizures with this generalization with falls uh, also applies. So when you think about patient selection, um, it's a palliative procedure. So uh, kids are generally um, uh, medically refractory uh, or drug resistant, meaning that they have failed at least two medications and that there's no discrete seizure focus, right? This is not a, a lesional type of epilepsy. And we're looking at um, uh, any type of seizures with rapid secondary generalization. So when we think about the approach, um, there's, there's different um, surgical techniques described in the literature, uh, but, but this one is, is kind of the most um, commonly described uh, where it's an interhemispheric approach. And, and you were, you're, we're looking at, um, at looking these, at these paired uh, pericolosal arteries overlying the corpus callosum. Now, when I showed that the reported complications if you visualize the approach, the, a lot of this uh, kind of makes sense, right? If the surgical complications are retraction injury, vasospasm, uh, those come from, from uh, retracting the, the premotor uh, cortex, um, uh, looking at the um, pericolosal arteries um, towards the ACAs. Uh, and also when we um, expose the splenium, uh, we're over um, uh, the great... Um, the internal cerebral uh, veins um, and vein of Galen uh, areas. Uh, we're also um, looking uh, uh, towards the ventricle. Um, so um, hydrocephalus has been reported and, and really from any craniotomy approach, uh, subdural and epidural hematomas and infections. That, that neurologic deficits uh, that are very um, uh, inherent or unique to the corpus callosotomy uh, are um, the, the mutism, akinesia, and disconnection syndromes. Uh, and also the hemiparesis um, uh, is theorized to, to be from a lot of the retraction injury uh, and the aphasia also from the disconnection syndromes. So when we look at outcomes reported, uh, I'll start with some series and, and then a pooled literature. Um, the seizure outcomes from 20-year uh, uh, experience uh, in the UK actually shows that uh, about half the patients have a really good outcome with uh, none to rare drop attacks. Uh, and then about half of the patients in this series had recurrence. And those with recurrence uh, did so within one year. Uh, and in general, patients uh, had a significant uh, decrease in anti-epileptic drug use. Um, but when you look, there's the, a 20% chance of transient deficits uh, and an 11% complication rate. When we look at pooled literature, this is in pediatric patients. Um, there were only 12 page, uh, papers um, included here, uh, but the, the key points are really that um, a, a corpus callosotomy is reported to have good seizure outcomes um, and, uh, and, and is um, relatively well tolerated in, in children. So when we look at, uh, at, at the different papers that were selected, when you look at the drop attacks, that's the, the dark navy blue, uh, and then other seizure types is in the lighter blue, you actually have a, a quite a high rate uh, of patients with a, a, a meaningful reduction in, in seizures um, with the angle one or two outcome. Um, so you know that that's important to, to note uh, when thinking about patient selection and and really the role of surgery 
um, and, and um, weighing it with the uh, surgical uh, morbidity. So this is a meta-analysis for corpus callosotomy that um, includes pediatric and adult populations. So this has a larger number of uh, included studies and uh, it will have a um, numbers uh, and analysis. So um, different uh, variables were looked at, uh, but if you look at really um, that kind of a darker diamond, uh, the, the rate of um, patients being free uh, of drop attack type seizures uh, were, um, were over the 50% mark. So like in pooled uh, analyses, uh, about 60%, um, you know, all comers. Uh, and uh, uh, younger patients uh, and those with a, a shorter duration of epilepsy um, and having a complete callosotomy rather than a partial callosotomy uh, did a little bit better. Uh, this is uh, my own analysis of uh, developing studies for um, uh, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome uh, over time, uh, looking at different uh, medications, VNS and corpus callosotomy. So in the green, um, you'll actually see that corpus callosotomy uh, from the literature has a higher uh, reported percent of seizure reduction. So it's kind of how I think about um, callosotomy in the literature uh, and, and its role. Um, even though it's a palliative surgery, it can be very powerful in terms of uh, reduction in, um, in seizures. Uh, and the, the drop attack type, um, and, uh, and that means a, a higher quality of life uh, and reduction in anti-epileptic uh, drug use. So the next thing is the extent of the corpus uh, callosotomy. So, um, so the, we hear about the anterior two thirds, uh, the complete, uh, and then also a, a posterior uh, corpus callosotomy. Um, so, we look at the, the anatomy of the corpus callosum, um, you know, reaching the, the rostrum uh, in the anterior portion is quite challenging. And also the, the, the splenium and that covering uh, the, the deeper veins is uh, also reported to be more challenging. So, um, and, and usually one docks on that, that mid portion. So um, when we look at how, um, how uh, the, the fibers are connected. Uh, this has some relevance for, um, for uh, the upcoming discussion. So um, recognizing this is a 3D structure. So looking at um, uh, comparisons uh, for outcomes of anterior two thirds uh, or complete uh, callosotomy, our, our colleagues in, uh, um, from St. Louis uh, looked at their own series of 58 patients uh, and um, found that um, all patients uh, had improved seizure reduction, uh, but the groups with complete callosotomy or anterior two-thirds callosotomy and then um, uh, having recurrence of seizures and then going on to a second stage surgery for a complete callosotomy uh, had better seizure control than those who had anterior two-thirds callosotomy alone. And then furthermore, the ones who had complete callosotomy up front uh, fared better than those who ended up having two stages of surgery to complete the callosotomy. However, the complete callosotomy up front had a trend towards higher perioperative complications, uh, but that trend was not statistically significant. Uh, so this is the numbers representation of that. Um, then looking at posterior callosotomy, which I think is, is um, very interesting, um, and uh, coming from our uh, Brazilian colleagues, um, this stemmed from um, a, uh, an observation by the group uh, of uh, uh, two patients um, who, who anatomically um, in their radiographs um, uh, were um, more amenable uh, to, to a posterior callosotomy. Um, and looking at um, probability maps, um, the authors noted that fibers from the premotor cortex and the primary motor cortex actually tended to travel through the posterior corpus callosum, um, posterior to the midpoint of the corpus callosum. So from there, um, they presented a series of 36 patients uh, who actually had a posterior corpus callosotomy. Um, and that is their preferred mode uh, of, uh, of callosotomy. And the authors noted that this would keep the um, the, the, uh, the anterior projections 
uh, and maybe help in, in terms of um, uh, uh, quality of life and kind of functional outcome. Uh, most of these children undergoing callosotomy tend to have um, uh, lower levels of uh, uh, IQ and, and general executive function. Um, so this was, named, uh, this was aimed at controlling the drop attacks uh, while trying to keep a higher level of function uh, to spare the prefrontal connections. And they reported um, that 83% of patients had a, a over 90% drop attack control. Uh, and um, in this surgery, um, the, the, the premotor and motor area is really not retracted because the approach is from a sitting and semi-sitting type of um, uh, positioning uh, and intrahemispheric from posteriorly to be able to get to these structures. So I think there's an interesting contrast for, you know, there are multiple ways to actually achieve uh, resection of the corpus callosum. So, um, so that's kind of the backdrop uh, for looking at the different types of, of surgical approaches. Um, I think I've already revealed my hand up front that I, I'm a fan of endoscopy, uh, but I think no matter what, the, the required steps uh, of the anatomy in, in a um, in a corpus callosotomy, and this is looking at it step-by-step step from a, an open uh, or endoscopic approach. This is the same anatomy. Uh, if you're going interhemispheric, um, you'll actually kind of um, ha uh, have a falx uh, and be interhemispheric. Then you'll look for the slimy white of the corpus callosum with the cingulate on either side. And you'll look at paired pericolosal arteries, um, uh, to kind of signify that you're in the midline looking at the corpus callosum. Um, and once you start um, dissecting the corpus callosum, um, you, you can actually use different instruments here. There's a CUSA, you can use controllable suction. Uh, some people use uh, uh, an instrument um, like, like a, a pen field uh, or a kind of dissecting type of instrument to, to split the, the white matter. Um, then you go forward uh, and following the paired pericolosal, you'll see the ACA, uh, respecting the ACA, that you'll go towards that genu um, uh, and really following that anatomy and following that curve. Um, and when you look posteriorly, you're going to um, you know, follow uh, along the white matter and then you're going to look at the, um, the, the splenium and you're looking to respect that arachnoid and, and see the, the deep veins uh, after the resection of the splenium, um, taking care to, to respect the planes. So re really those are gonna be um, anatomically um, your landmarks. So, and that is no matter what type uh, of visualization um, you're picking, um, that's what you expect to see. So, um, so uh, different approaches have been um, reported, uh, and I'm going to go through um, uh, some of you know how we think about this. So, um, this is a, a, a traditional um, kind of open approach. Uh, your landmarks for um, placing your incision and your bony opening are going to be centered over uh, your coronal suture. Uh, some authors say it's a half and half. Um, your bony opening uh, over um, anterior to the coronal suture and posterior to it. And some say it should be one third and two thirds um, of, of your bony opening should, uh, in relative to the coronal suture. Um, I, I tend to do a, a half and half. Um, and then um, here is uh, some pictures from the literature uh, that from that article I just showed you the open versus endoscopic uh, description. Um, this is a, a pretty big bicoronal incision uh, and a, a large bony opening uh, protecting that sagittal sinus. Um, this is a, a, a different option. Um, some authors use a U-shaped flap, a, um, a C-shaped flap, a J-shaped flap. Uh, I, I usually do a, a linear um, a paramedian cut. Um, but really looking at a, um, a interhemispheric approach. Uh, if you do use endoscopy um, and are comfortable with, with your reach, um, you can uh, use navigation with that uh, and, um, and then uh, be able to use a smaller opening. Uh, if you can plan um, your approach uh, with the navigation and make sure that you can reach everything. Um, also, uh, MR-guided uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy has been reported for corpus callosotomy. And this is um, 
This usually takes uh, multiple uh, uh, lasers uh, because if you think about dividing the corpus callosum into, into a structure that you can reach um, in a straight trajectories, uh, this will be um, this will be typically uh, three um, different types of uh, uh, passes. Um, one getting your posterior um, if if this is curving down, uh, if you're lucky and it's very flat, um, you can do a, a a straight from the back, um, and then um, but then having to think about how do you get your your genu as well. So uh, in in a patient, um, uh, how do you actually do that? Um, and also thinking about um, that that if you're coming from up top, you, you actually have to avoid the sagittal sinus. You have to be a little bit uh, off to the side. Uh, this is a little bit more off to the side um, uh, than um, that than one would expect in some of other reports. But really, you have to think about the geometry of how you're going to cover uh, a, a complete callosotomy if you were to do that, or an anterior two thirds um, with a laser. Um, so uh, what um, I, I've seen is that uh, the the perilesional edema uh, from from uh, laser callosotomy, even though the outside is really only um, a, a stab incision for the the um, the hole in the bone and the laser, um, you can really um, uh, have a minimally invasive surgery be be really kind of maximally invasive inside as well. Um, so you can achieve a disconnection. Um, uh, um, and um, uh, but when we looked at this um, in my former institution, we actually wanted to see, you know, what the role for minimally invasive versus an open uh, craniotomy was. Uh, this is uh, not published literature. Uh, we looked at um, a single in institution retrospective review, and we actually found no difference in the length of stay um, or, or discharge destination if people went to inpatient rehabilitation, outpatient rehabilitation with therapies, uh, or home. Uh, and in the uh, laser ablation cases, there were actually three reoperations uh, and one transient hemiparesis, actually, in that patient I showed with the um, uh, edema. Um, so we, we realized that that in a head-to-head -head comparison of open craniotomy versus um, laser, uh, that in, in our hands, um, uh, we actually found that open craniotomy had uh, better outcomes in terms of not needing um, uh, uh, subsequent surgeries, uh, having a, a fewer amount of uh, uh, perioperative complication or um, uh, transient neurologic uh, complications. Um, so, you know, from that, we actually thought about is there a role for an open type of surgery, but that's more minimally invasive. So that's actually how we um, how I got to um, uh, thinking about endoscopic um, surgery. Uh, and, and here there's an evolution in terms of doing cadaveric studies, um, looking at the reach and feasibility, and then thinking about um, a collective experience with technical notes and, and small series. The options for using an endoscope um, are um, uh, having the instruments go through your working portal uh, or having um, your instruments next to your endoscope um, and having some through a working portal um, and, and using a tubular retractor of some sort um, uh, or other uh, fixed retractors or really having a, a three-hand type technique um, and uh, uh, either mounting your suction or using that in your other hand. So, um, so the way that I plan it, it actually is, is a very natural evolution in the learning curve because um, uh, it's the same angles and trajectory as, as the way that I do an open um, callosotomy uh, uh, versus an endoscopic. So, uh, so I make sure that I'm centered um, over the um, uh, coronal suture um, and then making sure that I can actually reach both anteriorly and posteriorly. I navigate the endoscope um, mainly to um, make sure that that my bony opening and my reach uh, is is adequate. Um, and then here is a, an operative video of what that looks like. So, interhemispheric approach. We're looking for that slimy white, uh, you know, of the corpus callosum. Uh, we're working in between the the pericolosal arteries. And then you'll see we're we're respecting um, uh, that entry into the 
um, ventricle um, and, and um, staying on our side uh, and then really looking to work towards um, uh, dissecting the white matter, uh, but um, but following the pericolosal arteries in the ACA, and then now looking posteriorly, um, and you'll see there our selenium is gone. We can see through the arachnoid. We we can see the deep veins. So, um, but the falks uh, and and the midline are, are always your guide. Um, so uh, here um, you can show uh, that a postoperative DTI can confirm your disconnections. Although I'm typically um, uh, reviewing my, my surgical videos to make sure that I get everything. And I think the requirements for any approach uh, an open with a microscope or, um, uh, uh, or with an endoscope is that you need direct visualization and control. Um, no matter what. Um, and if over time we can minimize the, the surgical access related morbidity um, uh, of our reach, uh, that, that would be ideal. So, um, so in my own practice, I'd find um, more applications for endoscopy, but I think it's really important to think about safe application to make sure that no matter what your approach, that you are having uh, mindful patient selection uh, with favorable seizure outcomes, um, minimizing blood loss is, uh, is, uh, uh, comes along uh, with a, uh, a smaller approach um, and then having enhanced recovery with a, a smaller cut as well. But no matter what, um, the rationale for callosotomy is that surgical disconnection of the corpus callosum. Um, we looked at this up, um, up front as I started the talk that I wanted to, to kind of bring, bring our journey kind of back, right? That really what this is about is disconnecting um, those crossing fibers um, in the corpus callosum and really thinking about um, what you have at your, in your surgical armamentarium to be mindful of the possible complications and how you can plan the safest surgery possible for your patient. Um, and uh, really picking your, your patients for um, the best seizure outcomes uh, and to try to, to minimize uh, seizure-related um, uh, injuries um, and uh, morbidity. Um, and thinking about all the tools at your disposal. Um, so, and also thinking about, you know, as you gain more and more experience, um, the role of innovation, um, safety and feasibility are always uh, at the top of my mind and then contingency plans. Uh, for, um, for really achieving um, your surgical goals. Uh, I practice a lot in the anatomy lab, uh, play with our imaging uh, a lot. Um, if you do have the benefit of any type of uh, simulation uh, or uh, virtual reality or 3D printing, that is very helpful for practice before any type of, um, uh, of surgery uh, and really collaboration and, and disseminating everything that we learn, just like in this forum where I'm lucky enough to spend time with you all this morning. Um, really future directions are continual learning all together um, and, and really you know, doing better for our patients. Um, and I'm gonna end with this, um, the, this uh, slide, which is um, thinking about the role of surgeons uh, in epilepsy. Uh, we know that you know, first line treatment is medication, uh, but when we look at medical and surgical treatment for kids with refractory epilepsy, um, I looked at a, a national um, American database, kids act, um, actually have a higher survival at two and five years after um, surgery compared to the kids treated with uh, medicines alone. Uh, there are fewer ER visits, uh, fewer hospitalizations, and actually um, fewer uh, drugs and higher survival. So when we think about our role, um, it's not just doing cool surgeries, you know, or doing surgeries that help people. It's actually how do we get to the patients who can benefit from surgery and, and how can we collaborate with all of our, our neurology and medical colleagues better so that we can help more people. So thank you very much. Sandy, I think that was a great talk. Um, I think the main message across the board is that uh, we should uh, study and practice these techniques. And I think the younger we can perform them in, in our patients, the more benefit they get. Um, I would like to ask both of you for each indication, which has been the youngest that you have operated uh, 
Let's start with Jeff. What's the youngest stage you have done a hemispherotomy? So I've done a hemispherotomy inside of a year, but it was for a kiddo with absolutely catastrophic epilepsy. Um, I've done, I think, three of them now. Um, and I'm, I, the first one went great. The second one I stopped halfway through because we had a priori decided that we were going to stop when we reached a certain amount of blood loss. And the case was proceeding very, very nicely, but just simply because the child was so small, the number was, was, was a small number. And frankly, I regretted it because when I came back, I did not have nearly the nice planes that I did uh, before. So short answer to your question is they can be done inside of a year, but it should be rare. Um, it's in catastrophic epilepsy that threatens the child. You've got to have your best anesthesia people. You've got to fight every drop of blood from the beginning. The incision has to be planned to be hemostatic. Every single drop of blood needs to be battled with everything you've got. Um, but I, you can do them inside of a year. Probably for, for most centers, you're going to probably say something like three years. But for catastrophic epilepsy, I would still reserve a place for inside of a year. Sandy, what do you think? I agree. Um, I, I've done um, actually three uh, in, in, um, inside of a year as well, a three-month-old, a four-month-old, and a nine-month-old. Uh, catastrophic, um, you know, seizing so much that they could no longer even um, uh, suck um, or, or, um, uh, so, um, uh, I have a, um, body weight, uh, type of goal as well, uh, which is, uh, five kilos, um, that, that generally helps in just terms of, uh, you know, kind of team planning for, for, um, blood volume uh, and replacement if possible. And also the, the younger the child, that the peel planes that we rely on so much as epilepsy surgeons, that PIA isn't developed very well. And it exactly it. And that's the part that's actually the most challenging. Exactly. Um, because of the like, kind of the, the not quite myelinated brain yet. Maybe very the other point, yeah, the other point that I would make is, is that unfortunately, when you're talking about those really young kids, you're more often than not talking about your more different uh, pathology, your, your more different substrates, right? When you're talking about a catastrophic situation inside of a year, that's not going to be, <clears throat> that's not going to be post stroke. That's going to be a hemimegencephaly. That's going to be a holohemispheric dysplasia that's got the brain on fire. So you're not going to have the benefit of atrophy, of extra space, of some gliosis, of you know, enlarged subarachnoid spaces. It's going to be a hard case. It's going to be tissue that tends to be vascular. The P is not going to be there. So the little babies are tough. I would not start with that. Mm -hmm. After you've got some experience and you're quite comfortable with it, uh, I alluded very briefly to this in my talk. If you're dealing with something where you've got extra tissue like hemimegencephaly, I find it very useful to drop an EVD and incorporate the EVD in the edge of my craniotomy, at least where I can see it. And then you can literally slide down it like a fire pole and get the ventricle, get into the ventricle. And then you at least get a cotton patty in the ventricle and you can work from there. Uh, I found that useful in, in several, several hemimeg cases that I've done because I tell you, you get in there and things are oozing and bleeding and you've got a wide expanse of uh, tissue. It's very unpleasant. That was so interesting you, that you said that, Jeff, because I, I, I do that too. Um, and yeah. I, call, I tell my residents it's the Hansel and Gretel technique. Um, like <laughs> you leave yourself kind of breadcrumbs going Absolutely. into the ventricle um, because they're, they're so often um, just kind of like weird anatomy or this chunk of cortical dysplasia. And the last thing that, that you, you want to do ever is to get lost in a hemispherectomy and, and knowing, you know, where you are in midline and ventricle is so important that dropping that EVD in um, with, with an ultrasound or, you know, and anything that you have at your disposable, um, right up front is really important. Yeah, I think that's, I'm sorry, Adrian. One of the things that I learned from William Harkness at Great Ormond Street when he was doing his um, epilepsy cases was that as he goes into the ventricle and puts the carotenoid patty, he will use a 90 degree hook and that hook will go into the ventricle and he basically lifts, lifts the roof of the ventricle. So he constantly is just moving the hook forward and coagulating behind it if there's any vessel that he should catch. 
but it's a great way of not losing that plane and you're always within the ventricle and just going around it with the hook. So it's a great technique for disconnecting. That's a nice pearl. And you bring That's up an, any vessel that should be from below pearl. and coagulate it prior to the division. Um, and another thing that I would like to mention, because I think one of the, you know, there's always this remnants of information that follows a procedure. And I think a lot of people, whenever they think callosotomy, they're always thinking about disconnection syndrome. I don't know why it sticks so much in everybody's mind. And to be honest, after 20 years of doing this, at least in a child, I, I cannot say that I have truly witnessed a true disconnection syndrome. So um, this should not be a cause for limiting the procedure. And number two, we soon realized after we start doing, you know, I think around like 20 or 30 first cases of callosotomy, some of those would continue seizing and then we went back and completed the whole thing. So, you know, for the last, I would say more than 12 or 15 years, we do a complete callosotomy right from the start. And kids do great. So that should also be a goal that uh, you should look forward to achieve. Any comments, Sandy? No, thank you for putting this together. This was a, just a, a really great Adrian, can I, can I throw one, just two comments on Sandy's talk? First, of course, it was fantastic. Um, I think callosotomy is, 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 really has a role in our armamentarium. One of the things that I think is going to be that, that, that's been provocative to me is the relationship between callosotomy and VNS. Now, VNS is quite expensive, right? And not everybody has VNS available. But what's really particularly interesting to me is, is that the callosotomy curve can fall off a little bit with time, just like every other epilepsy procedure. But at the same time, the VNS curve's effectiveness tends to grow so that we've sort of begun to enter this phase where if you're a candidate for callosotomy, we almost uniformly try to implant a VNS because that we found that that's very, very helpful as far as that, that generalized type of epilepsy. And just one additional comment I would make before we close on Sandy's presentation, the most common mistake that I've seen my trainees make in the open approach is they confuse the cingulum for the callosum because the reach for the new learner down the inner hemispheric fissure is always a bit anxiety provoking. You're worried about that superior sagittal sinus. You're worried about traction on those veins. You see something down in the bottom of the hole, there's a structure and you end up in the cingulum, often through the cingulum into the roof of the ventricle. Okay, mm -hmm. it can happen, it's not a disaster, but the key to prevent it is two things. Number one, watch for that pericolosal artery and don't take tissue till you're on the far side of the pericolosal arteries. And two, the ivory color of the, of the corpus callosum is absolutely distinct at the bottom of the hole. Wait for the ivory color, don't take tissue above the pericolosal and you'll stay out of the cingulum. I, had, I reviewed a case one time where a person in an effort to try and do a corpus callosotomy had done a cingulotomy and fallen into the ventricle and I'm sure it's happened mm -hmm. many times. Adrian, great course. Uh, last pearl, if I may, the, um, for those interested in epilepsy surgery, there's another online <clears throat> presentation uh, tomorrow, about 24 hours from now. It's actually, um, it starts in the central, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's 90 minutes from right now, and it's about hypothalamic hamartoma, mm -hmm. and it's going to have um, a discussion about open approach and endoscopic, or pardon me, uh, lit laser therapy. And the way to find it is to just Google search the neurosurgical atlas uh, or ESTM, epilepsy surgery techniques meeting, write down ESTM or the neurosurgical atlas. Looks like a very good discussion uh, and would probably round this discussion out very, very nicely. Adrian, a fantastic program. Thank you for including me. No, Sandy, it's been you. great to see you. Thank, thank you, you both. So good to see you. Should we see the, the question, Seamath? Let's see how people. Yeah, I see something coming through the discussion asking about the shunt rate. I, I think that's actually a really relevant question. Um, uh, Sean Liu did a, um, a multi, uh, um, 
Center International Retrospective Study, um, uh, looking at the shunt rate, all comers, any technique in, in hemispherectomy. Uh, the shunt rate was a, a, about 25%, right, right between 20 to 25% any technique. Um, I, the um, Dr. Chandra um, uh, reporting on his um, endoscopic series, he has the largest series, uh, it is um, uh, reporting a drastically lower number. Um, so um, I, I don't, um, you know, I, um, yeah, so I, I, I think um, that uh, to me that that's really interesting, you, you know, like, can, can you convert that that kind of spillage uh, of, of, uh, of cutting across um, all these cortical surfaces, is that promoting some sort of inflammatory thing in the CSF versus not? I don't know. I, I've personally um, had a, about a 25% uh, shunt rate with uh, endoscopic procedures in my first 10, and then over time actually had that uh, drop off a lot. So I actually haven't had to shunt my, my last 15 so far, but, but also we know that, you know, the, um, uh, a patient can have, um, a need for, uh, a shunt, uh, in post hemispherectomy hydrocephalus at any time, right? One week after surgery, 10 years after surgery. So I, I think really that the proof will come later on as we follow our patients, uh, over a longer period of time. What, what do you think, Jeff, about shunt rates? I would agree with those numbers completely. Um, somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent, sometimes 25 percent range, uh, and I do think that technique does matter. And EVDs, for, for certainly for hemispherectomies, uh, EVDs are essential. Um, corpus callosotomy, not not so. Okay, so let's look at the questions. So, first question from Sandy Stock: Callosotomy clearly improves which aspect in a patient with medically refractory epilepsy? I think more than half got the right answer, which is mainly drop attacks, but it also reduces significantly uh, the number of seizures and, and the number of drugs required to control epilepsy. Let's see the next one, Emeth. The best place to perform the craniotomy for a colossotomy in the AP planum is, so two thirds anterior to the coronal suture, one third posterior, half anterior to thirds posterior. So Sandy, you wanna comment on that? Um, yeah, you know, so I, I had said in, in my talk that um, most places, most uh, sources, we'll, we'll talk about that one third, two thirds um, split, uh, but uh, over time uh, I, I've seen more and more people write about a half and half um, uh, split. So I, I actually think that the, um, um, one third, the two thirds, one third, uh, or that, um, well, the half and the two thirds don't like add up. Uh, but actually I think anything in the, uh, anybody who answered in that yellow to orange, uh, would, uh, would be correct. Okay. Let's see the next one. So the most anterior area for corpus callosum section is a, the tour scenario, which obviously is, it's not. The anterior white commissure, the colossal marginal artery, the choroidal point, or the posterior border of the foramen of Monroe. You wanna comment on that, Sandy? Yeah, so I, I didn't actually talk about this in detail in my talk, but it is following um, that genuine rostrum um, over to, to your commissure. So, um, so it, it's usually, that's actually gonna be your most challenging point. Um, but your your arteries and your planes will really get you there. Okay. Let's look at the next question from Jeff Stock. When if reflecting the frontal or temporal operculum, what anatomic observation confirms arrival at the circular circles? You want to comment on that, Jeff? Yeah, I think that um, th that... It, it comes back to that concept of the PIA takes you home when you're an epilepsy surgeon. And after you've done this dissection a time or two, you'll recognize how reliable of an observation that is, that you follow that PIA down. And when the PIA runs out, that's going to be your definition of the circular sulcus. So it's the loss of the PIA. You, the PIA um, 
you follow the frontal operculum pia down and you'll see the insular pia. And when the two of them run out, you're right there at the circular sulcus. So the correct answer is B, loss of pia overlying the operculum. There's no, there's no important vessels within that region. It's all subpeal. Okay. Okay. Let's look at the next one, Imad. So visualization of what structures posteriorly confirms completion of the intraventricular callosotomy. Again, Jeff. Right. So I just I put this one in here because this is an this is a area where people um, it, it can be a, a dark a dark hole and it can be a place where people tend to want to quit early um, and say, okay, we've got the back of the corpus callosum. Well, we only really need to do a two thirds callosotomy because two thirds, you know, get you there to properly do the corpus callosotomy from within the ventricle. You've got to see the arachnoid over the vein, the vein of Galen, right? It's just, it's a clear CSF containing space. You are in a white matter tract and you drop down and you suction aspirate it. And there it is. You're into a cisternal, uh, open CSF space. So the correct answer is green D arachnoid overlying the vein of Galen. And I would just like to add a comment on that. If for whatever reason, while doing epilepsy surgery or tumor surgery, you should uh, tear one of those small vessels that lead into the vein of Galen. Most of the time, just putting uh, some gel foam with a patty should suffice to stop. Do not coagulate. You will inflict more harm than good. Yeah, I agree so, with that completely. Yep. That's that's a tip for trainees. So the last one, Jeff. So this is the key. This is the observation from Professor Schramm that I swear I learned at a meeting over a over a uh, over an hors d'oeuvre. I said, Professor, how do you know that you're not going to fall into the hypothalamus or leave a bunch of tissue on the planum sphenoid alley? And he said, Oh, it's simple. He said, Just once you get the once you get the pericolosal. I swear he's the most humble, most generous neurosurgeon you'll ever meet in your life. Professor Schramm is wonderful. Uh, if you have the opportunity to hear him, do so. If you have the opportunity to read him, do so. He said, once you find the pericolosal, don't let go. Follow it proximally, follow it, follow it, follow it, follow it, follow it, because it is the key to the front of the operation. And he's absolutely right. It keeps you out of the hypothalamus and it keeps you from leaving a big chunk of tissue. What most people do that don't know this little pearl is that as they follow the pericolosal back, as soon as it starts to turn, they get scared that they're gonna you know, fall into dangerous subcortical gray and they take off to the planum sphenoid alley and they end up leaving two or three centimeters of frontal basal cortex still connected. And you see on the post-operative scan, it's, it's at an angle, it's not straight down. Follow the pericolosal back to the A to the A2 to the A1, the A1 to the bifurcation. Once you're at the bifurcation, you can see the edge of the of the um, of the planum, and you can uh, of the sphenoid wing, and you can just uh, cross right there, and and you've got it. You have an internal anatomic landmark. It's like a path. It's like a trail. You just follow it, and it takes you home. So, uh, correct answer is pericolosal back to the bifurcation of the ACA MCA. Choice B, red. Okay, so we should do this like every other week to have both of you. Today has been a great lecture. I think people have learned loads and loads. We've had over 140, 150 neurosurgeons around the globe learning from two masters. Um, I cannot thank you, both of you enough for these. Um, Salman, do you wanna say some words? I think it's brilliant. I really enjoyed both the talks. And Sandy, I think, uh, uh, first of all, Jeff did all the work, and then you just uh, had to put the icing on the cake. It was wonderful. Really enjoyed both the talks. And, you know, the tips have been brilliant. Uh, I, did, I'm sure I didn't know... I didn't know that Sandy was going to follow with that tech. And I think it, it, it was just great, Sandy. The, uh, the vertical and the uh, endoscopic was just such a, such a nice way to bring it about. So... Could, um, Thanks. Yeah. It, it just worked. Um, Adrian yeah, and Sandra Adrian, share this platform. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that that was wonderful. Thank you for um for for all that teaching. Absolutely. Brilliant. Um, what do we have for next week? So next week we have very interesting topics. 
uh, Gary Solanke from Birmingham Children's in, in the UK. Now it's a, it's a different Birmingham hospital. We'll be talking about the surgical management of Chiari syndrome. He has a very interesting approach to this. And of course, one of the topics that's coming of age and that uh, we should all be familiarized is the prenatal intrauterine uh, myelomeningocele closure. Samuel Baba from uh, the Arnold Palmer Hospital in Orlando will, will show some of his latest series and numbers. So by all means, please join, spread the word, and uh, happy trails to everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy. Okay, so we are gonna Thank have you. group photograph just now. So can you all switch on our videos and smile? <laughs> Come on guys, everybody switch on your videos, please. <laughs> Imad, are you getting this, please? Yes, sir, I'm taking it. So join your videos, please. Thank you. And smile. Are we done, Imad? Yes, sir, thank you. Okay, yes, sir. guys, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Brilliant thank talk. You all. And thank you, everybody, for